guided tour. Welcome to Imagine, a guided tour. Please make yourself comfortable and allow us to guide you in the use of Imagine by impulse. It is assumed that you have observed the minimum equipment requirements as outlined in your Imagine manual. It is also assumed that you are familiar with the basic Amiga operations and the terms used in this tutorial. Please bear in mind that this tape and Imagine are copyrighted materials of RGB images and impulse respectively and may not be freely distributed. This tutorial should be used in conjunction with your Imagine manuals and although this tape will make it easier for you to tap the power of Imagine, we make no claims as to the performance of the program or the results of using this tape. Our objectives are to guide you in the creation, loading, and rendering of three-dimensional objects and introduce you to animation. We encourage you to momentarily pause your VCR if necessary in order to follow along with your Amiga. Some editing was required to allow as much information as possible to be included on this tape, so actual Amiga operation times may take longer. We will start with a quick tour before diving deeper into the program. You may refer to the quick start section of your Imagine tutorial manual. If you have not yet done so, boot Imagine with your backup copy. We will now begin. The Quick Tour. Once you've started the program, it will load the imagine.pick file, which has the information of a registered owner across the top. Pull down in the project menu to New. Click on Disks. For this tutorial, we will be using a pre-formatted floppy disk named Imagine Tutorial. We'll name this project called Quick Tour. We need to have a new sub-project in order to store our picture files. Select New. We will name this sub-project Quick.1. For now, select OK, selecting the default settings of Imagine. We must now enter the Detail Editor by pressing and holding the right mouse button, dragging down to Detail Editor, Release. For the remainder of this tape, we will use the non-interlace screen. The faster you become in Imagine, the more you will use the keyboard equivalents. Once in the detail editor, we need to load objects. In the functions menu, pull down to add primitive. Release. There are six primitives which to choose. We will select Taurus, select OK, the default settings. Here you see a Taurus or more of a donut shape. Select the Taurus by clicking on the intersection, or you may press F1 when the object is selected. Notice in the Find Requester, the only object on screen is the Taurus, showing points, edges, and numbers of faces. This becomes important when you are metamorphosizing between two objects. They need to have the exact same points and faces. Selecting attributes will change the default settings. Attributes for this particular object are set to the color being white, We can change the color by changing the value in these boxes by either pulling the slider left and right, click and hold the left mouse button, or we can type directly into the box. Selecting a value of 255, 0, and 0 gives us a red Taurus. Notice that the box to the right 
displays, the color changes immediately. Select OK. Now we need to save this object. Release. We will save this to our pre-formatted floppy drive labeled Imagine Tutorial, Quick Tour in the Objects directory. We will label this Taurus 1. When the busy has gone out, the crosshairs return, and the disk activity light has stopped, it's safe to continue. Press and hold the right mouse button, pulling down to Stage Editor, Release. So you may select OK at this point. Now we have an empty stage. We need to load objects onto stage. Notice how that when we load an object, it pulls up the very last object saved in the Detail Editor, Taurus 1 in the Objects subdirectory. You can either select it by double-clicking here or a single click and selecting OK. For this tutorial, we need to view the object from the camera. The default setting in the perspective window is not from the camera. Notice how the object is too large or too close to the camera. We need to move it away or make it smaller. We do this by picking the object and selecting Rotate, Move, or Scale, either on the local or world axes. Notice the axes X, Y, and Z. The space bar will keep your edits, or escape if you happen to make an error, will not remember the edits. It will take you back to the object previous to editing. For here, we have selected Scale. Press and hold the left mouse button and move it in the down or left direction. Press Spacebar to keep and notice the update in the perspective window. This is the camera view. Now we need to rotate the object in order to get a definitive torus shape. Rotating it on the default z-axis will only spin it around and not value any change in the perspective window. From here you can select X or Y. We will rotate it on the Y-axis first and then the x-axis. You can see the updated change in each perspective window. Once we get the Taurus to where we'd like it, we select both axes, rotating, and then spacebar to keep the edits. Notice how from the camera view we're looking directly through the Taurus. Now, in order to see the Taurus, we need to add a light source. Release. All objects in Imagine are loaded in the very center of the Imagine world, the zero, zero point. We need to move it away from the center of the Taurus by selecting the object, select Move, and press and hold the left mouse button to move it up and away from the object. Here we're moving the light source as though it were shining directly through the Taurus. Press and hold the right mouse button in the project menu to save your changes. This updates a file called staging, remembering where all objects are kept. Once disk activity has gone out and the busy has come back to the crosshairs, Select Project Editor. We have been editing frame one. Select it. 
by clicking the left mouse button and select Generate. Notice the status bar at the top. Loading objects, initializing, frame one of the quick tour in the main directory called Imagine Tutorial. Now we are generating the file and it gives us a percentage of completion. You'll notice that when we get to near 100%, we are nearly complete. Once it gets to 100%, the cleaning up display arrives. That means it cleans spaces in between frames. You'll notice when you're doing animations how that helps very much. Now that the frame is selected, you can tell that by deselecting it by clicking anywhere to the right in this menu selecting it again and note the asterisk under the number one. You may now show it by clicking the left mouse button and imagine we'll pull down a display of your object. Congratulations, you have just created a three-dimensional object called a Taurus. At this time, you may want to go back into the Detail Editor and load various other primitives. There's the sphere, the tube, the cone, the plane, the disk, and again the torus. We encourage you to pause your tape at this time and to continue loading these objects, playing with the attributes, and loading them into this frame positioning them and rendering or generating the objects. Congratulations. You've created many objects, I hope, by now using Imagine. We must now start a new project, and in order to do that, we first have to close the previous project. We do that by pulling down to Close in the Project menu, Release, and pulling down again to New. If we were to start in a previous project, we could open up the previous project by selecting Open. In selecting New, we are still saving everything to that pre-formatted floppy drive. Notice how our previous names were there. We now need to enter new names. We will call this Tutorial. We must now have a new project subdirectory in order to save our objects pictures and staging information. If we were to have a pre-rendered system or a pre-worked on project, we would select Open. At this point, select New and type in the name Tutorial.Sub. Here we are at the resolution and all the screen information in this window. The rendering method is anywhere from black and white wireframe to full trace. The higher the resolution, or the closer to full trace you get, the slower the rendering becomes. For this, we will use scanline. It's a good medium. Picture and pixel sizes, we will use the default, the width of 320 and the height of 400. If we were to select larger sizes, again, the more work the program has to do, the longer it takes to get the work done. This is a good medium to choose. The path for the stills, 
Here we are in the Imagine tutorial, which is our pre-formatted floppy, and the path for a movie as well is the formatted drive. Notice in the path for stills, we're in the tutorial.imp file, which is the main directory for our project, in the subdirectory called tutorial.sub, and its file called pix. You can save stills in an RGBN Imagine format, or we can save them in an ILBM IFF type format. The Amiga is fully equipped to display 12-bit images. We can have them in ham and interlace. This is the medium that we'll be working in in this tutorial. Notice that the path for a movie is tutorial.imp, IMP, and tutorial sub.pix. It also saves everything in a file called anim if you're using a standard anim format, and it also saves things in anim in an imagine format. Select OK. Notice how the ghosting has gone on many of the select objects here. We now need to get to the detail editor. Most of your objects will be created in the detail editor. All of the editing of objects can be done in the detail editor as well. Notice how we have different views for the detail editor. The top, front, right, and perspective. By clicking on the name of that window gives you an exploded view of a full screen view of that particular selection. Notice how on the right hand side we can select directly and the left hand side if we click on that name again we pull back to the full four window screen. We will now add an object by creating a place for those points to reside. That place is called the axes, so we must first add the axes. In selecting coordinates, notice how in the upper right hand corner you can see the close to zero, zero point where all objects are loaded. Notice how we move the mouse up and down and left and right the respective values change. In crossing over, you'll see the respective values changing as we move the mouse left, right, up, and down. It's very important to understand the concept of a three-dimensional world. Notice that in the perspective window, that's a viewing area only. You do not create in the perspective window. In order to give you a better idea, we've created this picture to show you a house. Notice how in the top view, you're seeing the house in the front and the right. Everything is equally represented in the perspective window. Here we're looking directly down on top of the house as though flying in an airplane. In the front view, it's as though you're walking up the front steps. You can see the left and right side of the house while still seeing the roof you cannot see the sides of the house or the back. Notice the co corresponding window, door, and chimney. That perspective holds true for all four window screens in Imagine. It's very important to understand the concept of explaining a three-dimensional world in a two-dimensional realm. We have an intersecting point called the zero, zero, zero point. This point is where all objects are loaded into imagined screens. You can now move them from those points. Notice how the world extends in all directions, up, down, left, right, in, and out. Up towards you and to the right are positive numbers 
away from you to the left and down are negative numbers. Notice the y-axis going in and out, the x left and right, and the z up and down. There is no limit to the value of the x, y, and z axes in the imagined world. In order for this object to have any kind of form, we must now add lines. Adding lines does two things at one time, adds edges and points at the same time. We must now select the axes in which to assign these lines. We will create a wine glass shape by clicking the left mouse button along the outline of a wine glass. We will select the object or right Amiga 2. We will now give this object a shape by molding it. We will sweep this object. There are 12 particular sections available and the sweep of the angle is 360 degrees. The higher the number of sections, the more accurate the form becomes. And notice here, in selecting six, we have two, three, four, five, and six sides to the object. You may undo this by selecting right Amiga U or pulling down the undo. Notice that if we change the sweep angle 180 degrees, that would only give us half a glass. Select Undo, pull down to Mold, select Sweep, 360 degrees, 12 sections, Perform. There we have a reasonably smooth glass at 360 degrees, a fine representation of a glass for this tutorial. We must now give this particular glass its own individual attributes. The default settings for the attributes are a white glass. In order to understand more about the glass itself, we need to understand how objects are created and imagined. At the heart of every object is the point. There are many points to every object. The connecting line between two points is called an edge. Any three edges connected by three points generate a face. The face is the smallest object in Imagine that can have its own particular attributes. Notice how this A is made up of many triangles. A triangle or face is made up of points, lines, and faces. Again, points, edges, lines, faces. The attributes of an object are very important. It gives its, its own particular characteristics. The default settings for an object are a white object with nothing very interesting involved. We can edit each one of these particular attributes of an object by pressing and holding the right mouse button and dragging down to Attributes. The keyboard equivalent is right Amiga F7.
Here it brings up the attribute requester. Fast draw is an ability to, when you have many objects in the imagined world, fast draw is very important so that it does not draw the exact representation of the object. It will just give you a square of the object or a uh, just a brief representation of the object. Fonging is more of a smoothing or sanding of the edges. If you'd like a very sharp-edged object, turn Fong off. In order to have a smooth glass, we'll need Fong on. The first topic to be covered is color. Notice we have the three color bars, red, green, and blue, in values from 0 to 255. There are two methods to changing these by pressing and holding the left mouse button and dragging the bar. You'll notice that the color box to the right changes immediately to represent the value being selected. And also the numbers to the left change as well. Or if you know exactly the color you wish, you can type in the value in these windows. Notice how the color box to the right immediately represents the color. For more accurate editing, it's quicker to type directly into the box. Note that if the values are exactly the same, we have a gray or a version of white. If white is 100% or if all colors are 100%, we have absolute white. The closer we get to zero, the closer we get to absolute black. For this particular glass, we'll have a blue glass. In order to make the glass a lighter blue, we need to pull up the other colors, bringing it towards white. The next value is reflectivity, or reflect. If you can imagine, that's exactly what it means. What colors of the color spectrum will virtually bounce off of the object? If we have the values at 100%, all color will bounce off of this object, therefore rendering it invisible. It's a good idea to stay somewhere near 150 or lower in order to make your object visible. The higher the value, the more invisible the object becomes. For this particular glass, we will select a very low setting. Filter. Filter is the value of the attribute that says what color passes through the object. Notice how we're still using the color bars. We can change these values just as we have before. The higher the value, the more of that color will pass through the object. Lower the value, the less color will pass through that object. If we have an absolute green object as a filter, we will see nothing but green coming through. Specular. Specular is that white hot spot, let's say, on a black bowling ball. Dithering. Dithering is a smoothing technique between any two colors, allowing the illusion of more colors than are actually present. A lower dithering value will allow a reflective object to be more convincingly rendered. Hardness. Hardness interacts directly with specular in that a higher hardness value will give you a very small specular spot. A low hardness value will spread that specular spot over a wider area, virtually softening the object. Roughness. Roughness gives an object a more texturous appearance. The 
higher the value, the more rock-like it would become. The lower the value, the more smooth the object becomes. Shininess. A high shininess setting gives an object a glossy or plastic appearance. To review, we have the color of the object blue with zero reflectivity and zero color passing through the object. Before we select OK, it's a very good idea to give every object created in Imagine its own definitive name. You'll see later on in this tutorial that it becomes very crucial. We will label this blue glass. Notice how upper and lower case does not matter when hitting return. It makes everything in the upper case. Notice how that we are limited to eight characters, so you must give them shortened clue names. Select OK. We must now save the object. Pull down to save. Notice that it defaults to where our last object had been saved. In tutorial, quick tour objects directory. We can either climb through by selecting parent or we can select disks and going direct to imagine tutorial, tutorial directory and selecting objects. We can now give it its own characteristic name here, calling it blue dot glass. You are not limited to eight characters at this point. When the disk activity light goes out and the crosshairs have returned, it's safe to continue. We will now change the attributes of this class by applying a texture. Notice we have four possible textures to apply at any one object at any time. For this tutorial, we will use one texture. In your Imagine Disks, there is a directory called im-textures. Select it. For this object, we will use checks. Select OK. Notice how if we were to cancel and come back directly now to textures that it takes us directly into the texture directory. Select checks and now we can edit the texture. Check size would be the actual size of the check. We will have it at 50. Notice we can edit the color of the check itself using the red, green, and blue values. We will have a white check by giving the red, green, and blue identical values. The higher the values, the hotter the color or the brighter the color. We can also change the reflectivity and filter values of each check. When you're done editing, we need to edit the axis to apply it to the object. Release. Notice that the texture axis is different from the object axis. By selecting M for move and pressing and holding the left mouse button, we can drag this axis anywhere into the screen. This axis needs to cover the entire object, so we'll select S for scale, L for its local, and all three axes are selected. Press and hold the left mouse button, dragging it 
upwards or to the right to increase the value. Drag it so that the axis entirely covers the object. This may take some practice, so please take your time and practice often. By selecting Move and dragging the axis down, we completely cover in all three windows the object. This is the area that the texture will be applied. Select OK. We now need to give the object its own definitive name. Notice we're having a blue object with white squares or checks. We will call this texture or TX glass. Select OK. Select Save. Note that the previously saved name is pulled as a default. You may edit this by selecting the Delete key and typing in the new name. Again, you are not limited to eight characters here. When the crosshairs have returned and disk activity light has gone out, it's safe to continue. We will now apply a brush to this object. Select Attributes. Select Brush. An assortment of brushes are available from RGB images. Here we've created a brush and called it a nice palette. Select it by double clicking or selecting OK. We need to apply this brush to the object, so we need to edit the axes. Select Edit. Much like the texture axes, the brush has its own individual axes and how it is applied to the object. Select M for Move and drag the axes down so that it covers the left hand and lower side of the object. Select Scale and L for Local. Press and hold the left mouse button to drag it out to covering the object. For this particular object, we will be wrapping it on the Z axis. We need to edit the Y axis to be a zero value. You can do this by pressing the X, Y, and Z keys on your keyboard and highlighting only the Y axis. Press Y. Press and hold the left mouse button while pulling down or dragging down. You'll see the value of the Y axis slowly come to zero. Once this is done, select the space bar to keep our edits. Notice there are various methods we will use the wrap Z method on the vertical axes. Select wrap Z, select OK. Notice how the texture is still there. We need to drop the texture, select it, go down to the center, select drop. It releases all that information from the texture from the object. We now need to give it its own characteristic name. We will call this Brush Glass or BR Glass. Select OK. We now need to save this object. Pull down to Save, Release, and give it its own definitive name. We will call this Brush Glass by using the Backspace and Delete key. Once you've typed it in, hit Return. It's the same as hitting OK. Having created all the objects needed for this tutorial, we now need to go to the Stage Editor. Press and hold the right mouse button. In the Project menu, pull down to Stage Editor. Note that if we do have an object in the Detail Editor still, we will get this requester. 
OK to quit detail editor. At this point, select No. Assuming you have already saved your objects, I'll show you how to go directly to the stage editor. We can delete the objects in the stage editor by pressing right Amiga D or pulling down in the function menu to delete all picked objects. This way, when we select stage editor, we go directly into the stage editor. The stage editor can be likened to that of a theater, where actors equal objects, camera equals the audience, and lights equal lights. Let's begin by deselecting the camera view, which is still active from the quick tour. This will then activate the perspective window. We will now load our objects created in the detail editor. First, we will load the brush glass by double clicking. Then we will load the blue glass by double clicking. and then the texture glass by double clicking. We will not be locking our objects to the grid so we can turn the grid off. Press and hold the right mouse button in the display menu. Pull down to grid on, grid off. There are various zooming abilities of Imagine we can zoom in on the object. We can zoom out or right Amiga O. Or we could go to the set zoom. This will jump us immediately to the desired value. Here we enter 0.5. Notice how we have three objects directly on top of each other. We need to separate these objects. There are several ways in which to pick these objects. Since these axes lie directly on top of each other, we must go to one of the find requesters. We can find by the object list. All objects on the stage editor are listed here. Select by clicking. Then we pull down to Pick Select. Note how it changes color. We now select M for Move. Press and hold the left mouse button and drag the object to where you would like it to stay. Notice how the other objects have seemed to have disappeared, yet in the perspective it's updated. In going to the Find Requester, we can see that the objects are still there. We need to go to the function called Redraw. Press and hold the right mouse button in the Display menu and pull down to Redraw. Notice how it redraws the objects in each of the windows. We still have two objects lying directly on top of each other. We can find them by their characteristic name set in attributes. If we type in texture glass or TX glass, we find that we have already moved that particular object. We can go now to the find object, select brush glass or BR glass, pull down to pick select, select M for move, Press and hold the left mouse button and drag it to where you would like it positioned. Now we can redraw or right Amiga R and you'll see the third object appear in all four windows. Select it by clicking on its axes. Select M for move and dragging it to where you would like it to be positioned. We have now loaded all three tutorial objects into the stage editor.
By clicking and holding the left mouse button on the perspective view drag bars, you can change the view of the objects. This way you can edit their positioning by seeing how they look from above, left, right, and below without having to move the camera. The next topic to be covered is the camera. In order to properly align the camera, we must first select the camera view to be displayed in the perspective window. We do this by pulling down camera view in the display editor. We must now move the camera. We must have a place to move it to, so we need to move out or zoom out. You can do this by repetitively selecting zoom out. Select the camera by clicking on its axes, M for move, pressing and holding the left mouse button and dragging the camera. You can move the camera in any one of the top, front, or right windows. Once you hit the space bar, you'll see the perspective window, which is the camera view, refresh. We can assign the camera to always hone in on one particular object. If you've forgotten which object we have laid in the center, left or right, you can find out easily by pulling down the Find Requester, select any one of the names, and you'll see that object turn yellow. We would like to find the name of the center object so that we can have the camera always looking at the center of that object. Notice how textured glass is to the left, the blue glass is in the center, and the brush glass is to the right. In the Find Requester by Name, we will type in blue glass. We must now go to the Action Editor in order to assign the camera a place to always be looking. You'll notice here that we have highlighted bars. Notice to the right we have a black area called actor position align size hinge and effect. And we also have the black bar where frame one is. If you'll notice the intersection where frame one and align are we need to delete and then add our own special assignment. Add by clicking the left mouse button on frame one, align. We need to align it to an object or track to an object. The center object was the blue glass or bl.gls. Select OK. Notice the drag bar. We can see every object in the stage editor, in the action editor, by pulling down the drag bar. When done, click on Done, and it will refresh the perspective window to be the camera view. Notice how the camera is looking at the dead center of the blue glass. If you are satisfied here, you can click with perspective and see a representation of what the render will look like. At this point, we would like to move the camera further away from the objects. Click the camera, select M for move, and drag. Now that we've moved the camera, we need to refresh the alignment. So go into the Action Editor, select Done, and you'll see in the perspective window 
the refreshed view. We've been viewing things in a wireframe format. There are two other formats to view. Solid. This gives you a view of a wireframe that you cannot see through. It takes a little longer to render, but gives you a more accurate representation. The shaded is only active when you highlight the perspective window as a full screen. It gives somewhat of an idea of how the lighting will affect the object. When completely satisfied, pull down to Save Changes. This updates the file called Staging. two methods to adding lights in the stage editor. The first is to pull down in the object menu, pull down to add light source. We can pick it by pulling down in the function menu, pick select, select M for move, press and hold the left mouse button and drag the light source where we would like it to be positioned. For this tutorial we'll have it pulled in between our point of view, the camera, and the objects so that the light will be cast down onto the objects. The other method is to go into the action editor. We'll need to get to the bottom of the actors list. Notice how at the bottom of the list it says new. We need to add a new light source. Position the crosshairs so that the actor and frame one are highlighted. Double click and select light source. We now have the light source info menu. Light pattern can be spherical, cylindrical, conical. It may cast shadows or have a diminishing intensity much like an incandescent bulb. The further away you are, the weaker the intensity of the light. Notice how we can select the lights colors and their particular intensities. The lower the value, the less intense the light becomes. For this tutorial, we will select a value of 200 in the red, green, and blue. Select OK. We now need to change the position of this light. We can do that in the Action Editor by selecting Info, placing the crosshairs on frame 1 and position. Notice how Imagine loads the object in the 0, 0, 0 position of the world, much like it does in every editor. We can change these values here, and the result will show in the editor itself. We will select negative 500 on the X, 200 on the Y, and 700 on the Z. When you're satisfied with these edits, select OK then select done and the results will show in the stage editor your light is no longer positioned in the zero 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 to select the light pull down the find requester and select light source one select M for move and drag the light source to where you would like to have it positioned we will pull this forward of the objects and slightly to the left. Select the space bar to keep your edits. Pull down to save changes. When the crosshairs have returned and the disk activity light has stopped, it's safe to continue. Save your changes often. There is a third light source located in the Action Editor in the Globals called Ambient Light. It is a non-directional light. We can select the red, green, and blue values. We have the horizon color. 
the zenith, which is the color overhead, and the negative zenith, which is the color immediate below. Here we will select the ambient light, a value of 100. Be careful in using ambient light. Use too often or too strong, it can wash out the objects. Notice that the color box to the lower right updates as we change the values. Ambient light is a useful tool in lightening shadows. When satisfied, select OK. To get back to the stage editor, select Done. At this time, we'll save our changes yet again. Consider saving as saving trouble. The more you save, the less trouble you'll have. We've edited ambient light and our second light source. We now can go back and edit the original or the first light source by entering the action editor, dragging down to light source, we can click in the drag bar and go up incrementally. Place the crosshairs with the info select, which is the default, on the actor in frame 1. Notice the value 255. We will make this equivalent to our light source point 1, giving the red, green, and blue the intensity of 200. Select OK. Select Done. Pull down with the right mouse button in the project menu and save changes again. We're now ready to generate our scene. In the stage editor, pull down in the project menu to the project editor. All objects are generated in the project editor. Click on frame 1. To unselect it, click to the right. Notice that if it is not highlighted, the generating will not occur. Let's review our parameters by selecting Modify. Notice that our rendering method is Scanline. Our picture and pixel size is 320 by 400. Our saving path is in the tutorial disk. If satisfied, select OK. Now that our frame is selected, select Generate. Notice the status bar across the top. We are in tutorial, and it's working on frame 1. It's initializing. It's creating a workspace with which to generate the object. The first step is the palette pass palette is the colors being used. When the palette pass is complete, it begins generating frame number one. Now that you've begun rendering your image, this may be a good time for you to take a short break. Or, if you wish, you may leave your VCR running to view some artwork created using Imagine. If your image has not finished rendering after viewing the sample artwork, please stop your VCR until the rendering has finished. When we return, we will view your newly rendered image.
notice that we're coming up on 100% complete. Once at 100% complete, it does a cleanup. This is more evident when rendering many animation frames. Notice how we can only show the object when selected, when the frame is selected. If we select show without the frame being selected, we get nothing. Select it by clicking on that frame column. Select show. And there we have the results of our work. To get back to the project editor, hit the escape key. Let's display it one more time. If at this point, while showing your image, if you cannot get back to the project editor, you've either hit a key or clicked somewhere in this window. Press and hold your left mouse button when you move the mouse to the very top of the screen and pull down. Notice how the project editor is right there. Click in the Imagine Project Editor and hit the Escape key. Then you will be back into the project editor. Animations are created in the stage editor. The first thing we need to do is create a workspace in which to move the camera. So pull down to set zoom, type 0.1. Our edit fields are updated. We need to pull down to add an open path. We will name this path in our pre-formatted floppy drive in our project called tutorial in its objects directory we will name this path return notice how it loads it in the 000 point we will pick the selected object select M for move and drag it aside We will be creating a circular path around this object, so we need to edit it. The upper point is the ending point, so click and select M for move. Select the spacebar to keep the change. Now select the lower point, select M for move, and move it down. In creating a circular pattern, this is not a very good representation of a circle, so we need to add points or add split points. So in the path menu, pull down to Split Segment, click on it, and select M for Move to pull it aside. Spacebar to keep. Pull down to Split Segment again. Click, select M for Move, drag it aside. Pull down to Split Segment again. We now have enough points to make this a reasonably smooth circle. Click on the starting point axes, select R for Rotate, drag until the path extends out to the right hand side select spacebar to keep the edit in the object menu pull down to transformation select alignment notice how this is very close to a negative 90 degrees select negative 90 and perform select the second edit point pull down to transformation select alignment Notice how it's close to zero degrees. Enter zero. Perform. Select the third point. We now need to rotate this to be a path going straight across the top. Hit the space bar to keep the edit. Pull down to transformation. Select alignment. Notice how it's close to 90 degrees. Enter 90 and perform. Now select the end segment and move it to where the result would be, down at the bottom of the page or the start of the loop. This will give us a smooth transition. Position this so that the path extends to the left. Select Transformation, 
a line, notice how it's a negative 90 degrees, or very close. Select Perform. Now we can move our third point, move it to the left side, select R for Rotate. You can slowly see the form of a circle taking shape. Pull down for Transformation, select Align. Notice how it's close to 180 degrees. Perform. Now we can position the top one. Select M for Move. All we need to do at this point is fine-tune our path to be a circle. This may take some time. Please take your time and practice. Notice how we select each edit point, select M for Move, and Spacebar to keep the edit. Do not get the end point too close to the starting point. That will allow you to have a more smooth animation. Once we're done editing the path, we need to pull down to Pick Groups. This will give us an opportunity to save our path. Do you want to save the path? Yes. We will save it in the Objects drawer as Path. We now need to go to the Action Editor and assign the camera to this path. Select the number of frames to be 12 in the highest frame count. Select Delete and position the crosshairs over the camera position. Select Add. Click once on frame 1 in position and once on frame 12. Select Follow Path and enter the name Path. Select OK. We now need to align the camera, so select Info on Alignment. We will have the end frame be frame 12. Notice how it's still aligned to the blue glass. Select OK. Click in the drag box to reveal other objects in the stage editor. Click in the actor and we will show that we need to have this extended to 12 frames. Click again in the drag box. For the blue glass we will extend it out to 12 frames and select OK. And We will now rotate this glass in its alignment. The starting frame is 1. The end frame for the first turn will be through frame 3. We will rotate this on the x-axis 90 degrees for these three frames. Now notice how while we're in the info edit we cannot change it. We need to add more rotations. So select frames 4 through 6, a tween alignment. We will rotate this an, an additional 90 degrees to 180. Select OK. Then frames 7 through 10, tween alignment. We will add another 90 degrees to 270 degrees. Select OK. And then 10 through 12. Tween alignment. The full 360 degrees. Select OK. We will now go to Info and extend each object into each of the 12 frames. Select OK. Click again in the drag box. We need to have each one of the light sources in each frame. Enter 12. Select OK. The second light source. Enter 12. Select OK. And now we need to have the path for the camera to follow in all 12 frames. Enter 12. OK. Now we will preview to make sure that each one is in all 12 frames. Select Done. It's a good idea at this point to save all of our changes so as not to lose them. Pull down in the Project menu, Save Changes. We can now preview our animation in the Perspective window by pulling down in the Animation menu to Make. We have the start frame is 1, the end frame is 12, and one step between each frame. So it'll be frame 1, 2, 3, and so on. Hit Return or Enter to start the preview. Notice how in the perspective window, 
it redraws and gives you the frame number. When you get to frame 12, we can now play the animation. Pull down in the animation menu to play once. Notice the speed. Select play again. Select quit. We will now play the loop. The animation controller, this is a drag bar for speed. We can accelerate it or slow it down. We can stop it, step through forward by clicking, or step backwards by clicking. We can rewind, which takes us to frame one, to play over again. We can also see a full view of this animation by play big and then play loop. To have controls, pull down the animation screen and you see your animation controller here. You can speed up and slow down as you see fit. To stop the play big we need to pull down and select quit. It's a good idea at this point again to save our changes. From here we select free RAM. That will free up the space in RAM in order for us to render our animation. You do this in the project editor. Select range. We have start frame 1, end frame 12, and each frame in between. Select generate new frames only. That should not be on. We will select make for making the animation. We will make a temporary file from the pick list. We will select yes in making a looping file. Notice in the status it says writing movie. We will delete the pictures because there is not enough space on one floppy disk to contain the stills and the animation. Now that you have selected make from the stage editor, the Amiga will create the animation file. Take this time to view some animations created by your fellow Amiga artists using Imagine. If your animation file has not finished generating after viewing these samples, you may either view them again or stop your VCR. When we return, we will proceed with playing your animation. Once generation is complete, we must load the animation. Notice the ghosting of play once, play loop, and drop. When the ghosting disappears, we are now ready to play the loop. Select play loop. In the anim And here we have our 12 frame animation. 
You can control the speed by selecting the function keys, F10 for slow, up to F1 for fast. You can step the frames by selecting the space bar. A higher frame count will render a smoother animation but requires more storage space, more than a single floppy drive can hold. Congratulations! If you followed this tutorial in your Imagine Manual closely, then you have just entered the exciting world of 3D computer art. RGB Images is emerging as a leader in this exciting industry and we offer a range of services and products to aid you in becoming a professional in this promising field. Some of what is available from RGB Images includes rendering and transfer to videotape from any Amiga 3D program. The stills on this tutorial were rendered and displayed in both 12-bit and 24-bit. IFF brush packages are available in 12 or 24-bit for texture mapping the objects you create in any Amiga 3D program. Tutorial tapes on using Firecracker 24, DCTV, and other 24-bit display devices are available. For information, contact RGB Images, P.O. Box 85639, Hollywood, California, 90072.